In this video, I want to talk about the somatosensory cortex, how it's organized, and what some of its functions are. Let's begin with the basics. In humans, the primary somatosensory cortex, S1, lies in the postcentral gyrus. So this is that cortical area that's bounded by the central sulcus on the front, the postcentral sulcus on the back, and the lateral fissure at the bottom. I'm going to take away these labels just so I have a little bit more room. This area corresponds to three of Brodmann's areas, three, one, and two, and I've listed them in that order because that's the order that they lie anatomically. Brodmann's area three is closest to the central sulcus, whereas two is closest to the postcentral sulcus. There's also a secondary somatosensory cortex. This is called S2, and that includes parts of Brodmann's areas 40 and 43. It lies on the upper side of the lateral fissure. Finally, there's an area that I'll call the somatosensory association cortex, which includes Brodmann's areas 5 and 7, which will further process information. I've been showing you pictures of a side view of the brain, but as this animation shows you, the strip of tissue that's making up the somatosensory cortex extends over and into the longitudinal fissure as well, so we can see it on the medial surface, and that's true for areas 5 and 7 as well. Well, now that we know where the somatosensory cortex is, the next question might be, where does it get its information from? So I'm just going to remind you of some of the ascending somatosensory pathways. Pain and temperature enter through the spinal cord in what's called the spinal thalamic pathway, and they travel up to the thalamus, and some of those inputs then continue on to the cortex. A lot of them don't, but some of them do. Mechanosensory information travels through the dorsal column medial lumniscal pathway and also reaches the cortex. And finally, you should know that somatosensory input from the face and the head also projects to the thalamus and from there to the cortex. Now, when we think about the somatosensory cortex, maybe the thing that most people know, the best known feature of the somatosensory cortex, is that it has this topographical map of the body's surface. One textbook describes this as looking like a trapeze artist that's draped backwards over the surface of the brain, with the legs and the knees closest to the midline and then the upper limbs and the face extending down further down the side. Although the body surface is depicted more or less in a continuous fashion, it's not at all to scale, so that the hand and the face are overrepresented relative to their actual size in the body. This distorted map of the body feature is given the name homunculus, and I think these images here, which show us the homunculus from various angles, do a really good job of representing the amount of space in the somatosensory cortex which is devoted to the various parts of our body. Now I've been showing you pictures from humans where we have the somatosensory cortex here, but this structure can be found in other animals. There are a lot of studies that have been done with monkeys, so for example, the somatosensory cortex of the macaque is here, and there are a lot of studies that are done with mouse somatosensory cortex as well, and it lies here. Now, each one of these somatosensory cortices will have a homunculus, but the homunculuses will differ so that the representation of the homunculus in the human with the emphasis on hands and on the face is different than what we might see for the mouse unculus, where, for example, input from the whiskers is heavily weighted in the mouse brain. Now, in humans, the homunculi were worked out by surgeons, including by Penfield, who drew those based on the representations that he did when he did brain surgery. More recent work has shown that this is an oversimplification because if we zoom in on this region of the cortex so that we can look at what's going on here, we can see that there are actually four different homunculi corresponding to four different regions. Here's area 3A and 3B. Together they make up Brodmann's area 3. Here's area 1 and here's area 2. Behind it would be find Brodmann's area 5 and 7 and in front of it would be the motor cortex, area 4. And what I want you to know is that each one of the areas in the postcentral gyrus, 3A, 3B, 1, and 2, each have their own homunculus. Here's an illustration from a monkey where we can see this. We're looking at flattened cortex, and we're looking at the areas 3A, 3B, 1, and 2. Each one of these sub-areas has a complete and continuous map of the body surface. They're similar so that if we look at the very top, we can see the leg going across the top. If we look um, further down, you'll see that there's an area labeled wrist in each of the four maps, but they're not exactly identical. And that in part reflects the fact that these different parts of the somatosensory cortex are doing different things.
Area 3B is the true primary somatosensory cortex. This is the part of the cortex that receives most of the input from the thalamus. Most of that input, about 90% of it, comes from cutaneous touch receptors, so it's information from the skin surface and mostly mechanosensory, although there will be some temperature, some pain, and some proprioceptive as well. Area 3A also receives information from the thalamus, but it's mostly involved with proprioception, so muscle stretch and joint position. Area 1 receives input from 3B, the thalamus, as well as other cortical areas, and this is involved in higher features, such as extracting information about texture. And Area 2, which receives inputs from 3A and 3B and the thalamus, provides information about size and the shape of an object. I'd now like to give you a little schematic to walk you through the inputs into the somatosensory cortex and then also the outputs from the somatosensory cortex. So this is my cartoon version of this system. Down here is the thalamus and it has the ventral posterior nucleus complex where we'll be getting information from somatosensory inputs. Here is the somatosensory cortex. Remember, it's got those four different areas, 3A, 3B, 1, and 2. And then there are two higher order streams that I've already mentioned, the lateral parietal complex, which will include area S2, and also areas 5 and 7 in the posterior parietal cortex. And this might be a good time for me to point out that area 2, the subset of the somatosensory cortex, is different from area S2, the secondary somatosensory cortex, so don't get those two confused. All right, well let's try and walk our way through this. Well, somatosensory information enters the thalamus, and we get information from touch receptors in our skin, from pain and temperature, as well as from proprioceptors. I've color-coded the ventral posterior nucleus complex to remind me to tell you that although this somatosensory information is converging on the thalamus, it's kept separate so that proprioceptive information projects to a different part of this complex than does the touch information and the pain and temperature information. The bulk of the output from the thalamus flows into area 3B. This is the subpart of the somatosensory cortex that truly is functioning as the primary somatosensory cortex, the place where most information first goes and is first processed. Almost all of the information that's processed in area 3B involves cutaneous touch, although there are neurons that respond to pain and temperature information as well as to proprioceptive information. Area 3A also gets a considerable amount of information from the thalamus. Most of this is proprioceptive, and Area 3A is really involved with muscle stretch, with joint position, and proprioception. Both areas 3B and 3A then project to areas 1 and 2, where there's higher order feature extraction. Now, I should say that there's already been a lot of convergence of information. The receptive fields of the cells in area 3B are already responding to input from some three or 400 different sensory neurons, but this information is integrated with even more input in area 1. The cells in area 1 respond mostly to touch, and they're thought to be involved in extracting information about texture. Area 2 gets input from both area 3B about touch, as well as from 3A about proprioception, and this part of the somatosensory cortex is involved in detecting information about size and shape. Now, I should tell you that even though this figure is already getting pretty complicated, it's an oversimplification. So, for example, areas 1 and 2 both get direct input from the thalamus, and there's also a lot of reciprocal connections between each of the areas in the somatosensory cortex. Leaving that aside for a moment, let's look at the output. This comes in two streams. So first, some information projects to the secondary somatosensory cortex down in the lateral parietal region. Here, even more features are extracted, and this is a place where we start to see the cells responding not just to somatosensory information, but also to other kinds of modalities. So for example, the sound of two hands rubbing together can stimulate some cells in S2. Information from here then projects to what I'll call the ventral temporal area, so parts of the limbic system like the amygdala and the insular cortex. The other stream projects to the posterior parietal cortex, and this part of the cortex is also multimodal. It receives information from the visual system and from the auditory system. The cells in the posterior parietal cortex are also a place where there's a lot of bilateral activation, so many of the cells in this part of the cortex respond 
not just to information from the contralateral side of the body, but also to the ipsilateral side. This is particularly true for the right hemisphere. You might remember that the left part of the cortex, the left hemisphere cortex, is heavily involved in processing information about language in humans. And the idea then is that the right side of the cortex has had to take over some of the functions. So it's thinking not only about information in the left half of the body, but also about the right side of the body. So many of the cells in the posterior parietal cortex respond most strongly, have the highest frequency of action potentials when an animal is asked to, to reach out and grasp something. So it seems to be involved in planning and guiding movements. Not surprisingly, then, we've got output to the frontal motor areas where the neurons that will drive those movements are located. Well, I want to give you a little bit of an example of what some of the cells in areas 1 and 2 look like. What are their receptive fields? So just remember that in general, these higher regions in the somatosensory cortex, area 1 and area 2, they have larger receptive fields than in 3A or 3B, and they're going to give more complex responses. Here's an example of a direction-sensitive neuron in area 1. So what the researchers did here is they made recordings from a neuron in area 1 of the cortex of a monkey, and they stimulated the surface of the body by sweeping its hand in one of eight different directions. So for example here, we see the trace of action potentials that's elicited when we start at the point between the ulna and the wrist, so down here, and then sweep up towards the fingers and the radius, so between the thumb and the first finger. And what you can see is, as the animal skin is brushed in that direction, there's a train of action potentials. If instead the researchers brush that same axis but now moving in the opposite direction, the response is much less. And if it's brushed in a completely different direction, say between the radius and the wrist, up towards the fingers and the ulna, there's almost no response at all. Here are some more examples, this time from area 2 neurons. Now there are several different types of neurons here, so let's just look at them one by one, beginning with the middle row. This shows us direction-sensitive neurons, which are what we were just looking at. So as with the experiment I just described, the researchers are recording from a neuron in area 2 while they're stimulating the skin. So in the particular example that I've highlighted here, they sweep. They start close to the wrist, sweep up towards the fingers, and then come back. And each time they move in the direction towards the fingers, there's a burst of action potentials. But when they reverse and they're coming back towards the wrist, the response is much less. The same neuron shows an even stronger response if we look at the direction across the palm on the other axis. If we start near the thumb and then sweep across the palm, there's a burst every time they move that stimulus. But when it comes back the other direction, there's almost no response. So these are direction-sensitive neurons. There are also neurons that don't care about direction, but are just sensitive to motion. So here's an example. Here, when they go in, they stimulate starting at the base of the thumb, move out towards the thumb, and then come back. Each time they move, whether it's out towards the thumb or from the thumb down towards the palm, there's a burst of action potential. So these are motion-sensitive, but they're not direction-sensitive. And finally, here are some orientation-sensitive neurons. So this is a neuron, and we stimulate it up towards the finger and then back down. And every time there's a motion in this direction, there's a small burst of action potentials. But when that same neuron is stimulating in the direction across the finger and back, there's a big burst of action potentials, showing that it's more sensitive to movement in that direction than it is to one in the proximal distal direction. One of the things I'd like you to think about is how you could actually build a neuron to show this type of receptive field by integrating information from neurons earlier in the pathway with simpler receptive fields. The somatosensory cortex is one of the parts of the brain where plasticity, the ability to change with experience, has been extensively studied. And so I want to close by talking a little bit about that. So I'm going to show you data from one experiment by Merzenich and his colleagues. They were working with owl monkeys and they were looking at area 3B. And as you know, that's a strip of tissue. What we're looking at on the right-hand side is just a subpart of that area 3B, the part that corresponds to the hand. And just to orient you, it's been flipped 90 degrees clockwise relative to the orientation shown in the lower magnification on the left. What we're looking at here is what part of 3B is responding to each of the digits. And so you can see that in a normal monkey, digit number 2, digit number 3, and digit number 4 each have their own area.
Well, what these researchers did was they amputated the third finger, and then they waited 62 days and redid this experiment. And what you can see now is that that yellow area, the part that used to respond to the third digit, it's gone. And instead, the two adjacent areas for digit two and for digit four have grown in and have overtaken that space in the cortex. You might say, well, what do the receptive fields look like of the neurons in the area that used to be 3B? Well, here they are. Each one of these circles is representing the receptive fields, and you can see that most of that cortical space now is devoting to processing information about the fingertips from digit 2 and digit 4. Well, these are kind of gruesome-sounding experiments, but they have real clinical applications, because sadly, it's not unusual for humans to lose a limb, and we'd like to know what happens in the brain in response to these amputations. I'm going to close by reading you a really brief excerpt from one of Oliver Sacks' clinical stories. If you're not familiar with Sacks, I highly recommend him. He's a clinical neurologist, and he's written several books for the lay audience describing various patients in a really human way. This is an excerpt from one of his early books, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, and it's very short. A sailor accidentally cut off his right index fingers. For forty years afterwards, he was plagued by an intrusive phantom of the finger rigidly extended as it was when cut off. When he moved his hand towards his face, for example to eat or scratch his nose, he was afraid that this phantom finger would poke his eye out. He knew this to be impossible, but the feeling was irresistible. He then developed severe sensory diabetic neuropathy and lost all sensation of even having fingers. The phantom limb disappeared too. So my little challenge for you to think about is what could be happening in the somatosensory cortex? At what level could we see something happening that could account for these clinical symptoms?